Good day, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. John Ward. I'm the director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination of the Task Force for Global Health uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, today, we're continuing our conversation with um, the Global Hepatitis Elimination Champions uh, for 2020, where we can hear more about their work, uh, get to know them, and develop collaborations with them uh, as we all move forward toward our common goal of eliminating viral hepatitis globally. Uh, I'm joined today by Kenneth Gabagumbi uh, from Kampala, Uganda, who's done remarkable work, particularly uh, to help uh, increase awareness uh, uh, regarding the uh, large burden of disease and premature mortality from hepatitis B infection um, in his country and now in other parts of Africa. So I just wanna uh, welcome Kenneth and thank you for your work. And let me just start off by introducing yourself and giving your name of your organization, please. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, my name is Kenneth Kabagambe. I'm the founding executive director for the National Organization for People Living with Hepatitis B, uh, a national uh, driven patient organization registered in Uganda. And recently, I'm also the founding director of the Africa Hepatitis Initiative, uh, an organization trying to mitigate the impact of viral hepatitis in Africa, working closely with uh, stakeholders uh, that are very passionate and, uh, and passionate about hepatitis elimination in Africa. So my work started in 2012 when I realized that um, I was hepatitis B positive. Uh, this was uh, at a time I had uh, lost a colleague to hepatitis B when I was uh, for my undergraduate at Makerere University. At such a time, there was limited information about hepatitis. So this was a new disease to me uh, after losing a colleague. That's when I realized that there was a, a disease called hepatitis. So it gave me the courage to also know my status, uh, basically because I wanted to have myself vaccinated. Unfortunately, the tests turned out to be positive. Of course, in the first uh, days, it was so frustrating. But uh, to me, it acted as an opportunity because I was not ill. So I realized that there were so many people out there who are having hepatitis B, but they didn't know that they had hepatitis B. So I made my status public. I engaged with the media personalities, my community, my friends. But in, the, in so doing, I realized that my friends were actually de-associating de themselves from me because they also had uh, misconceptions about the, the transmission of hepatitis. B. So they thought that hepatitis B is transmitted by casual contact, uh, playing within the same uh, environment, and maybe interacting, just the mere interacting. So it was quite a hard decision for me to make to go public, but uh, the reason why I did this, I thought something needed to change, because even the health workers had limited knowledge about hepatitis. I was initiated on lamividine after doing a hepatitis B surface antigen only, which was very wrong in the future when I realized that this was a wrong practice. So I thought there was a lot of things that needed to change. And therefore, with this kind of experience, so disheartening, I thought I should mobilize the patients and the communities that were facing the same challenges. So then we formed the National Organization for People Living with Hepatitis B. The major reason why we formed this organization, there was a lot of stigma and discrimination in communities. More so there were no services at public health facilities that were really uh, catering for the people who are having hepatitis B. So when we formed this, we thought we would 
use our own experience to share with the patients and their communities because there was a lot of uh, domestic violence in some homes where one person, where one couple would test positive and the other partner tested neg negative. So in order for us to address some of these issues, we thought we would use our own experiences to address the issues. So in 2014, after we had registered this organization legally as a, a community-based organization, we then uh, had to advance it to the national level because the problem was national. The region where I come from is a little bit lower in prevalence compared to the other parts of the country. So we thought in order for the country to benefit from our advocacy, we needed to have this organization registered at national level. So we got a recommendation from the Ministry of Health and WHO country office, appreciating that really there was a need for such an advocacy organization. So we registered fully. And in 2013, because we started in 2012, immediately when I, when I got tested positive. So in 2013, we officially wrote to the Ministry of Health showing our dissatisfaction on the way hepatitis B was being treated at the national level. Because there was no program that was being, that was, at, was in place at the Ministry of Health. There was no dedicated officer at the Ministry of Health dealing with hepatitis. So we thought this would change, and the only way to change was to uh, hold the Ministry of Health accountable by, by expressing our concern. So we rallied behind the cultural leaders, and uh, the major cultural leader we rallied behind, or we, we, we worked with, was the cultural leader for the Lango subregion in northern Uganda, where the prevalence was high. So we set aside his uh, subjects, and they realized that the prevalence of hepatitis B in their region was actually high, and people were being, uh, I mean, people were dying because of the disease. So the cultural leader wrote to His Excellency, the President, again, showing their, dis their dissatisfaction. And the time they wrote, it was a time of uh, electioneering. So we're going into elections. So the President had to make a directive to the Minister of Health to bring in interventions that can actually um, help the people understand the burden and also seek early diagnosis. So in 2013, again, we held a charity walk. This charity walk basically was to rally political support of different political uh, organizations in the country. So we invited the president of the Republic of Uganda. Uh, fortunately, he appreciated that this was indeed a burden and it required his political support and commitment. But because he had earlier plans of traveling for a business trip in China, he delegated the prime minister, who is a medical doctor, uh, Dr. Ruhakan Agunda, to represent him at this charity walk. So during this charity walk, we presented to the president the challenges the patients were facing, lack of uh, a clear referral system, lack of uh, a funded program for hepatitis, lack of uh, clear diagnostic centers and treatment centers for hepatitis. So because we had invited members of parliament from the regions where the prevalence of hepatitis B was high, so when they were, when they were discussing the budget allocations in parliament, for the first time in history, because of the charity work that we had, the members of parliament were able to allocate three million US dollars towards hepatitis B program in Uganda. And this has actually been recurring from that time, from 2014 to 2015 to date. And this is the, 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 these are the funds that um, have actually shaped the hepatitis program in Uganda. So we have kept on with the advocacy, engaging with uh, different stakeholders to ensure that hepatitis B uh, uh, 
is recognized, is given the profile that it deserves. Now we, we are also left with the task of hepatitis C and D, because now we have at least some program running for Hep B. The only challenge we have at the moment is we do not have a proper grounded uh, program for hepatitis C. And as we speak right now, as you might be aware that hepatitis B coexists with hepatitis D, we do not have data on hepatitis D as a country. And so this is something that we also want to advance in our advocacy. We need to have at least some data on hepatitis D. The data for C is not so adequate because the data we currently have comes from the blood banks. And most of the blood bank, the, the donors are critically chosen. So you cannot take that as um, a national picture for hepatitis C. So this is something that we also want to do. And um, last year, together with partners like uh, WHO, um, uh, Ministry of Health, we held the first African Hepatitis Summit. And we are glad that during the summit, one of the key outcomes was the commitment of the Egyptian government to treat 1 million Africans who were chronically affected with hepatitis C. We still have a challenge as a country that hosted the, the meeting that we have actually not benefited from this because uh, the minister has been so slow at uh, following up. But other countries like uh, South Sudan have already started benefiting from the presidential initiative of, of treating the 1 million Africans with hepatitis C. So um, we thought that meetings like the African Hepatitis Summit need to be in place because we have had Africa is challenged with the hepatitis B uh, compared to C. So if we are to have hepatitis B eliminated, we need to also advocate for the birth dose because most of the infections for hepatitis B are acquired during maybe childhood. So if we can actually prevent the mother to child transmissions, then we shall be able to have a free hepatitis B continent. So the onus now is to ask the people who are in the fight against hepatitis to ensure that we work with people who have a passion, researchers, credible organizations to ensure that we have these, um, these uh, uh, issues addressed. So uh, because we want to advance our, ex we want to share our experience, our Ugandan experience to the rest of Africa, we thought we should form the Africa Hepatitis Initiative as a regional organization that whose vision is basically to mitigate the impact of viral hepatitis in Africa. And we have started, we are talking with different uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. and the, there seems to be positive discussions going on. So with this, uh, allow me to stop from here, unless if you have any other question that you want to know further. Thank you so much. Thank you. And of course, I have a few more questions. Um, <laughs> that was very, very informative. I, I um, uh, have two questions. One is about maintaining that political commitment in Uganda. It's great to hear that they responded to your walk. Um, that brought to mind, they, they, they respond to your walk because they saw that uh, public support and concern for this effort, um, or they, they, it took them um, uh, to uh, go and look at the data and remind themselves the high prevalence of hepatitis B uh, in Uganda. Uh, so I'm interested, what do you think were the critical success factors that really got them on board? And then secondly, you know, how do you keep that political commitment going? Because as you know, in a, it's not a one year and you're done. We need a sustained political commitment. So how are you working to maintain that uh, connection with the, uh, the government so that that support stays with you? Yeah, thank you, John. Um... It's quite uh, interesting that uh, we have actually kept the, committical, the political commitment. Now, what we did, for example, we ensured that we offer testing services to government officials. 
And during the testing exercise, for example, that we did at the Ministry of Health, some health officials, Ministry of Health officials, realized that some of their children and relatives were affected with hepatitis B. So this was not something that they had, uh, they associated themselves with, they understood that the problem is within themselves. And therefore, if they don't act, of course, their own relatives will also be victims of uh, the complication that come with hepatitis B. So that has been so, so much important. And also the president is very, very supportive. And I think the reason why the president is supportive, partly, his home district where he comes from has one of the highest prevalence of hepatitis in this country. So I think that alone really gives him the onus to continue supporting uh, this program. So I think that is, these are some of the things that have actually kept the commitment. And also the, the good leadership at the Ministry of Health. Uh, these people also really have been so supportive and uh, I believe they know the impact, the economic impact of hepatitis B if left unattended to. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You know, there are very, you know, there's a number of important interventions, as you well know, to you fully prevent hepatitis and, and, and eliminate it. And you touched on uh, some of those. I uh, just wanted to uh, let people know what's the status of, of birth dose vaccination in Uganda and how do you see that uh, changing uh, in the near future and uh, the testing policies for adults who may be living unknowingly with hepatitis B as you were until you got diagnosed, you know, how is that, how, how, what's changing in Uganda to improve access for testing and treatment, as opposed to like new policies, obviously you know, civil society engagement like yourself, just really interested. I see those as the two big critical interventions, birth dose implementation and then uh, hepatitis B testing. So, so how's it going? Yeah, well, uh, before the COVID era, yeah. uh, really there was a lot of progress, positive progress in regards to uh, finding those missing millions. Uh, government has been so supportive that uh, it is actually scaling testing of hepatitis to almost all regions of Uganda. So they are doing it in a phased manner starting with the high prevalent districts to lower prevalent districts. So they have been able to cover already the, way, the northern parts of the country, the eastern parts of the country. And now as I speak right now, they are in central and midwestern Uganda. So, but because of the COVID issues, this has actually gone down. The beauty is that, uh, when those people who test positive are identified, we are, we are using the, the hub system, the HIV hub system, to transport uh, samples for DNA viral load to the central lab, which does the viral load in a few days, then transmits the results to the hub, to the hub centers, for the, hub, for the people at the hub centers to give to the patients. And when these patients some of them, when some of them are eligible for treatment, the treatment is readily available and free of cost. But like uh, we have said, these uh, treatment centers for hepatitis B are at regional referral level. And in some few districts at, at district hospitals, but well knowing that in Uganda, we have some districts that do not have district hospitals, so they have like a health center force where, they, where there is a clinical officer as the highest cadre. So these centers are not actually allowed to treat. And most of the Ugandans, that's where they actually lie. So there's, there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that uh, treatment and testing is decentralized to the community level. Very good. Um, 
Do you think more people in Uganda know about hepatitis B now and really see it as an important problem that needs to be addressed as a country? It, it certainly seems to be heading, heading in that direction. Well, uh, most of the key stakeholders already know about hepatitis. But of course, because of the competing priorities with other diseases and other sectors, even the three million US dollars that is being allocated for hepatitis B programs domestically is not enough because much of this money has been uh, put in the procurement of vaccines, uh, test reagents, but uh, community mobilization, awareness has been left, which is actually one of the critical issues that the program, if the program is to succeed, that needs this uh, issue of uh, mass community mobilization. Um, you know, I was fortunate to attend the first African Hepatitis Summit. Uh, it, was, it was really, really uh, very, very uh, informative program and you really got a lot of uh, engagement at very high level with the, within the Uganda government as well as other governments such as Egypt in, um, in particular. Yeah. Um, uh, and I know you're planning your second African Hepatitis Summit. So tell us a little bit about that summit. When's it going to be held? Where is it going to be held? And, and, and what do you hope to achieve uh, in the second uh, summit? Yes, well, um, we have uh, discussed with the Federal Republic of uh, Ethiopia about the possibility of them hosting the second African Hepatitis Summit in Addis Ababa. And good enough, they have actually welcomed and they are supportive towards uh, hosting this meeting. So we are also working with African Union and WHO Afro to ensure that we have this meeting uh, move forward. But as you might be aware, we are not so certain because of the current situation, COVID-19, we do not know whether 2021, because we are planning it for 2021 in July. So we are not sure that by that time, things will have settled. You know, there are a lot of travel restrictions. So we are not sure. Uh, so we are still there, we are much as we are planning, but our planning pace is a bit slow because of the COVID-19 uh, challenges and situations. But uh, what I can assure you is that um, the previous sponsors for the summit in Uganda are already informed about this summit and they are very eager to see the second edition of the African Hepatitis Summit. So we shall be uh, communicating in regards to any new developments that come through. Of course, we are holding uh, Zoom meetings with uh, uh, a technical working group in Addis Ababa and WHO together with the African Union. So we should be able to give a clear, a clear roadmap on how we are going to have this uh, meeting in Addis. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for your just remarkable work within Uganda and now in other countries in Africa. It's really, you know, it's really, really great to see how we're beginning to marshal the resources that Africa needs uh, in a lot of different ways to, um, to really tackle the problem for hepatitis B, which is, you know, as you well know, it's much more of a challenge than it is for hepatitis C. We don't have short acting curative treatments. Uh, the, the monitoring is a little more complex, the decision making around um, starting therapy and then continuing therapy, you know, is a challenge for both providers and patients. But at the same time, uh, you know, as you know, you can lower the risk of mortality for by over 50% if you get people diagnosed and treated on time. So the payoff, payoff is huge. And then if you can couple that with a, an effective vaccination program, you really are growing up that hepatitis B-free generation, um, you know, for the future. But we don't want to let people who weren't able to benefit from vaccination and became infected to 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 die prematurely from hepatitis B. And, and you know, thanks to you and the, your civil society mobilization, you're you're helping uh, people, you know, avoid that premature death. So you know, thank you again. Thank you, John, and thanks for everything. We look forward to working together because I believe uh, um, 
working together can help us eliminate viral hepatitis in the shortest time possible. We can, we have the tools and uh, there is, all we need is just partnerships and to see how best we can uh, eliminate viral hepatitis globally. I agree, uh, Kenneth, working together we will eliminate hepatitis. Thank you again.